I'm going to talk about the idea of the world getting better because we're here. I'll talk about the idea of the breathing city, the issue of design for eco-civilization, and to rethink the way we think about carbon instead of talking about it as a negative and start realizing that we are carbon and that carbon is actually a positive, unless we do the wrong things with it. The other thing I'd like to point out that uh, I'm here particularly because China and Iceland are sharing a world-class, real, profitable example that we've just heard about with everybody in the world. I get to work all over the world, and this is one of the great examples of what humans will do when they wake up and start to realize what is possible. What, what is possible is clean, renewable, geothermal energy for healthy urban growth. And this connection to human health is critical because from the moment you are born until the second you die, healthy air is essential to health, period. So. If we start to look at how we go forward, we realize that it's time for us to take down the chimneys. And what's powerful about the geothermal idea, especially as we just heard from Sinopec and from, uh, from Arctic Green, is that we're not just putting in renewable power, we're taking out the chimneys. This isn't just adding renewable power to the mix, this is taking down the chimneys. Now, in 1998, I was asked by President Clinton to represent the United States the China U.S. Center for Sustainable Development. The China chair was Madame Deng Nan, Deng Xiaoping's daughter. And in 1999, we exchanged this document, which was a call for cradle to cradle in the circular economy for China and the United States. And that's what we've been working on. Um, it, after that, we published Cradle to Cradle here as the design of the circular economy. And then in 2005, we have the China Circular Economy Development Forum here in China, and China is leading in this idea. This is t a year later in Davos, and I chair the Meta Council for Circular Economy, and it got taken up by the World Economic Forum, and it came from here. Now, as we look out uh, for a view of the world, you could start right here in, on Jingshan Hill in Beijing. And what do we see? If we're going to have visions of the future, it would help if we could see. <laughs> So what kind of vision do you have when you can't see? And do we all have the same vision? This is Delhi. This is Tehran. This is Seoul. This is Los Angeles. What do we see? The first job of an architect is to change the way we see. Then we rearrange the furniture. Then we build. But first, we have to be able to see. And to see means that we can be designers. Design is the first signal of human intention. So we have to ask ourselves, what is our intention? Because if these things are happening, did we design them? Did we design them to happen this way? Did we actually design our systems to poison the air, the soil, and the water? This is all of us together now. Look who's in this room. We're from all over the world. Why? Because this affects all of us. We breathe the same air. Of course we do. We take care of each other. Otherwise, we're all in trouble. So, how do we make the world better because we're here? Wouldn't it be nice to wake up in the morning and say, today I'm going to go make the world better? It's not the same as saying, I'm going to be less bad today. When people say, I'll be less bad, I'm going to reduce my emissions a little bit something. Being less bad is not being good. It is by definition being bad just a little bit less. So can you imagine telling your children in the morning, go out and be less bad today? This is not a great instruction. And yet most of our charts today, even in corporate social responsibility, look like this. We start off by saying I'm 100% bad, I'm going to reduce my badness, and my goal is nothing. What a message to the children. My goal is nothing, and you're making it difficult for me because I have to feed and clothe you. What a horrible thing to have to say to a child. And when we talk about zero is our goal, nothing? Or we're going to reduce our carbon emissions by 20% by 2025? That's really silly if you think about it, because what you're telling someone is what you're not going to do. This is the same as getting in a taxi and saying, quick, I'm not going to the airport. So, where are we?
are we going? So let's take what we don't want and let's put it under the line in the bad category and then let's take what we do want and put it above and then very businesslike up and to the right. We reduce what we don't want and we increase what we do want and we do it at the same time. So first we do an inventory and when we do products we do molecules. The good molecules, the bad molecules. We put them where they belong, we get rid of the bad ones, we put in the, the good ones and you have constant improvement. It's humble and invites everyone to come and join you in the journey. Now, if we think about the energy and geothermal and other forms of, of renewables, we have to be really careful not to fall into what I call the offset trap. The offset trap is when we find ourselves putting one foot in a territory, another foot in another territory that aren't the same territory. So if I say, for example, on the top, this is renewables, and on the bottom, that's my carbon emissions, to say I can use renewables to offset my carbon emissions is not science. Think about it. Because if my renewables are this big and my carbon is that big in terms of the amount of power, then, and that's zero, well, that means I could double my renewables and double my carbon and I'd still be zero. But the atmosphere just saw twice as much carbon. Renewables are carbon neutral. So the power of what is being talked about here with the geothermal is that it's not an offset. You put in the green one and you take out the red one. That's what we're supposed to be doing. And it's cost effective and it makes sense and people's lives get better. So we need a new language of carbon itself because we talk about demonizing carbon. We have language like being carbon negative is a positive. Tell that to children. They look at the adults going double negatives. You're gonna give me double negatives for the rest of my life? Being less bad is more good? That doesn't make any sense. Being negative is a positive. Because if carbon negative is positive, then carbon itself must be negative. But I am carbon, so how can I be negative? Do I shoot myself, dry up and blow away? Is that what I'm supposed to do? So we need some positive language here. So if we just quickly look at human behavior, which can be negative positive, because that's a value, human value, then we can recharacterize the carbon itself. We could call carbon escaping to the atmosphere above, above uh, normal levels would be called fugitive carbon. Whoops. And it's a toxin. A toxin is a material in the wrong place at the wrong dose and the wrong duration. Water is highly toxic if I surround you with it for six minutes. If you jump out of an airplane and hit the ocean at terminal velocity, it's a very big dose, very short duration, but it's highly toxic. So if you think about this, we're releasing toxins into the environment. Now, if you don't think that's, that's something we can live with, you, you do realize, if you think about things like, what if I said have lead offsets? We have children in Flint, Michigan that are getting lead contaminated water. Can you imagine going to those children and saying, we're gonna take the lead out of the water in Austin, Texas, equal to the amount of lead you have, and you're gonna be lead neutral. It's idiotic. So the issue is, when you have toxins, what do you do? You stop. You stop immediately. So then you can realize that in the middle, we have durable carbon. This is plastics being recycled wood and buildings, and these are carbon neutral behaviors. And then we have living carbon, the way nature designed it, to bring carbon from the atmosphere to the earth under the flux of natural energy systems. So the issue then becomes if we stop being carbon negative, which we do now in those images, and start moving toward carbon positive, a very interesting part of that picture are those green, I mean the, the red and blue loops. And that's what we're here looking at today. This becomes a carbon positive behavior because we take down the chimneys and we put in earth heat. Our cities then go from being linear cities of take, make, waste, and they move into a kind of circular city. And in cradle to cradle, we have biological nutrition, and technical nutrition, things that go back to soil and make food, things that go back to industry forever and provide use. And we can start to imagine designing that way. But the fun part, and I get to show you some buildings because I can't help it, I'm an architect. But if you start to think about it, I, I like to design buildings like trees. But please don't talk to me about zero emissions trees. When people, this is an ad for a car company. Look at this, our aim is zero emissions. It's a picture of a tree. Trees emit oxygen. So if our trees didn't have emissions, we couldn't breathe. And imagine, it, they release distilled water. They, they accrue solar energy, they fix nitrogen. They provide habitat, they release blossoms in the spring. 
They can change color and they can self-replicate. When's the last time you saw something designed by a human that you actually want that self-replicates? So that is really interesting. Now in 1989, I won a competition in Poland for a skyscraper. And I said, well, we can build it, but you have to plant 10 square miles of trees in order to do this building because the energy required to build it and operate it requires an offset of carbon by 10 square miles of trees. And the developer said, oh, no, we can't do that. That's ridiculous. I said, just price it. It was $200,000. It was one-tenth of the marketing budget. Imagine. This is what we need to do. And then I thought, well, what if I could design buildings like trees? What if I have buildings that make more energy than they require and give it to their neighbors? What if it, they distill water? What if they have birds? So we did the first net zero energy positive verified building in the United States in 1994 at Oberlin College. I did it with NASA. It was done for a normal academic budget and the building makes 30% more electricity than it requires during the year. This is YouTube's headquarters. This is the ancient grasses of this place on this roof. So the birds flying overhead look down and go, oh, it's our people. They're back. Imagine. Ford Motor Company, the world's largest green roof, 1999. We found the technique in East Germany. It was camouflage that had been developed by the Stasi to hide the MiG fighter jets during the Cold War. Lightweight camouflage. We used it on the whole roof. It's now the world's largest green roof company. Purifies the water. And then NASA asked me to work on the Mars Space Station. And I said, I really can't go to the red planet until we've come back to the blue one first. So would you mind if we had the space station design team and we did a building on Earth? So we did, with a normal federal budget, ahead of schedule, we did this building here, the curved one, right at the headquarters of NASA Research. Those big buildings in the background is where they did the space shuttle. Those are the wind tunnels. So our aesthetic became the wind tunnel. We'll put the structure on the outside. This gives me my solar shading that the engineers can't cut off during the budgeting process. Because if you cut off my solar shades, the building falls down. And this was done with a normal budget for a federal office building. It's the highest performing building in the federal government in the United States. And they say you don't need to be a rocket scientist to do something smart. But what if you were? What if we started thinking like this and take our highest level of best tools? So I decided to apply to a skyscraper. So here's a 100% renewably powered skyscraper that feeds people that. We could do that. Here's a factory in, in Chicago. It has, it's a soap factory. It has the largest greenhouse on top of a building in the world. Why not? On the roof, it's real estate. It buffers the heat and cooling of the building. It saves a lot of money. And now we have jobs for the neighborhood and they have fresh green food. It's a wonderful thing. We have people working inside. We have people working on top. This is a factory in India making motorcycles. We put all the structure on the roof and realized we had braces for free for the solar. And in between, we have greenhouses. So we used to have 1,000 people working inside. Now we have 450 people working on the roof, growing food for the families downstairs. This was for the China Development Bank. They asked me just to conceive what would a city that could feed and clothe itself and power itself look like? This is a carbon positive city that feeds powers itself, 128 square kilometers for 100,000 people. So when we start thinking of how many things we do at once, we can have solar with farming. Why not? This is in the Central Valley at Davis. We're bringing back the water to the, to the dry places. We bring back the food. Because the earth belongs to the living, not to the dead. And if we leave the children a dead world, it's not their world. It's our world, and we killed it. So the history will be written in the soil and in the health of the soil. We've just seen reports that China's soil is now 19.4% contaminated for food. Imagine that. Are we doing this on purpose? Is this our intention? We can imagine oil becoming soil again. We could take chemical companies. Oil is soil without the S, heat, temperature. Look at it back. Bring it up, make it compostable, use it for agricultural mulch films. We can be 100% renewable in energy, water, and soil, and we can have an ecological civilization. Why not? It's a question of design. We just have to have a vision. In order to have a vision, let's clear the air so we can take a deep breath and get back to work. Thank you very much.